all. Hello, everybody. Um, I would like to welcome everyone uh, to this year's last Blaze panel discussions. There's been three. This is the third. Uh, these discussions are a part of our initiative, uh, Blaze Inclusion Awards, that highlights companies, organizations, and individuals, which amplify through their work diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging in the Nordics. Uh, as you know, today's topic is leveling up inclusion and belonging in the Nordics through a justice lens. And as you can see, we have a wonderful panel of speakers today with us, as we always do. Um, I just would like to mention for all of you who are also expecting uh, uh, our speaker from Greenland, Nivika. She cannot uh, join today, uh, but, and we will of course uh, miss her in the conversation. We were looking forward to that, but she will join us on one of our future events. Uh, for sure, she will be at the Diversify Nordic Summit that is happening at the end of September in, in Oslo. And you've, if you're interested in, in the summit and when it is, you can find information on our website. So uh, before we start, I would like for all of us to, to introduce ourselves to you. I will go first. Uh, my name is Eva. I will be the moderator today. I'm the program director at Diversify. And I'm very happy to be here uh, for our um, audience that might have vision impairment. We always uh, uh, describe ourselves. So I'm a woman in her 40s. Uh, I have light hair, uh, light skin, brown eyes. Uh, I'm wearing a black jacket and I have kind of like an orange background. Uh, okay, now I'm going to invite our speakers to also introduce uh, themselves and I'm going to do it according to my screen. So Astrid is first on my screen. Astrid, please, can you start? Thanks, Eva. And um, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining today. My name's uh, Astrid Sundberg. Um, I'm um, a white woman, sort of blondish hair, or I always say it's kind of the color of dirty dishwater. Um, <laughs> if you want some really good visuals on that. Um, I'm wearing a khaki green jacket, um, a, a, a white background. You might see half of a, a butterfly picture on my screen as well. I'm not sure whether you can or not. And um, thank you so much for having me here. I, uh, I think this is about my eighth appearance uh, for Diversifying Her Space. So I'm, I'm kind of waiting for retirement really. And um, I'm always humble to be here. I, um, I love the work that this community does. And I'm so inspired by the evolution and, and, and growth of the organization as well as really excited about DNS 2023. Um, so very, very briefly about me, I'm a, I'm a Scandi Brit, I'm based here in Oslo, Norway, I've been working in uh, leadership focused DEIB roles for much of my career, or certainly with a, a closer focus for the last 10 years. Um, my background is in the tech scale up and startup space, and um, I'm starting a new job in about two weeks time for um, the conduit in Oslo, who are my uh, who are my new employer? So um, yeah, really happy to be here. Thank you for having me. And as much as anything, um, I'm here to learn today, like uh, like always. Thank you, Astrid. Um, Muneza. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Muniza Rosendahl, and I'm joining you from Copenhagen, Denmark. Um, I'm wearing a yellow shirt uh, and I identify as a woman, uh, I'm brown, I've got black hair and a blurred screen. Um, I'm the CEO of a small association in Denmark called Equal Access, where we sort of try to help um, Danish businesses with actually uh, making their work environment open to and for all. So, uh, so we, we very much work with the DEIB uh, agenda, but I must also admit that I'm fairly new to the concept of justice and as Astrid, really looking forward to learning more and uh, hopefully also hearing all of your good questions. So thank you very much for having me and thank you for joining. Thank you, Muniza. We are very happy to have you. <laughs> 
And then the next on my screen is Alexandra. Yes, thank you. Hi, I'm Alexandra Morgan. I am um, wearing a flowered blouse, I would say. Yes, I think it's flowered. Um, have brown hair, brown skin, brown eyes, and a blurred background um, <coughs> of the color white. And I work for Avanad, um, Avanad Sweden more specifically. And in my role there, I am a change management consultant where I work uh, almost full time with implementing change management with different clients. When I'm not doing that, I am the inclusion and diversity lead for the Nordics in Avanad. Uh, that means setting our IND strategy, managing our IND team, and working with all the fantastic people we have that engage with us in our IND community at Avanad. So yes, briefly about me. I'm so glad to be here and I can't wait to kickstart and um, yeah, learn more as Astrid and Misa said. Thank you, Alex. We also are looking forward to hear from you and learn from you. Um, and last but not least, Chiso. Hi, y'all. My name is Chiso Mudeze. Um, I am a black woman, curly-ish, curly hair. Um, uh, brown skin, I guess like, as my daughter would say, dark chocolate. Um, <laughs> I am wearing a, uh, uh, a brown jacket that actually predates me. It was my mother's like way back when, before I was born. Um, and a yellow uh, t-shirts. Um, uh, my screen is blurred. Um, you might be able to see the outline of a round clock. Um, also what mentioning that today is going to be a great test in multitasking for me because I have my three month old baby with me who is currently nursing. So if I have to go off the screen, that's why I'm just trying to like, you know, keep him alive. Um, <laughs> <That's good. laughs> um my background, uh, I am an economist. I am also the founder of Diversify. Uh, I am um, a diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, uh, uh, strategies, consultant, enthusiast, and always approach my work from an intersectional equity and justice perspective. Uh, yeah, looking forward to learning and engaging and also, yeah, hearing some of your questions. Uh, happy to be here. Thank you, Chiso. Uh, okay, so I guess uh, we can start with our topic. Um, it is quite clear that DIB plays a very important role in, in shaping inclusive workplaces and driving social prog progress in general. Um, in this effort to create a more fair and inclusive society, it is quite important to actually explore the concept of justice. Uh, recently, maybe some of you uh, noticed that justice has gained significant attention and it kind of became a buzzword in the context of DIB work. Uh, however, despite this increase and buzz uh, around justice, its impact uh, on the DIB discourse um, seems to be hardly nuanced and uh, hardly is going beyond the buzz. Uh, so its impact and understanding is relatively limited. So today uh, we will delve into the topic of justice and explore its nuances and significance uh, with, of course, a specific focus on the Nordics. So um, <clears throat> to begin, uh, I would like to ask Chisholm if she can give us an overview of justice and how it should be thought about uh, within this context. I mean, the context of DIV. Uh, yes. Um, also, just a quick disclaimer that <clears throat> justice is massive, and I have been learning it for the better part of, I think, 25 years. Uh, so there's only so much that I can articulate in 10 minutes. So with Eva, we decided that it was probably just fair to put down some definitions that we want to have in mind as we have this conversation in how we frame it. So I'm going to share my screen um, and just walk you all through. OK, I hope this works. Not working. Great, Eva, maybe are you able to share your screen for me? 
Okay, just a sec. Um, can you just send me? No, wait a minute. No, I don't have the link to the to the presentation open. Yes. One so, second, you know, it was a presentation <laughs> session without a technical challenge. Okay. Um, if I've sent it to you on Slack. Okay. So I'm opening it and sharing the screen. I'm just walking you through <laughs> what I'm doing. I'm sharing the screen. Okay, can can everybody see it? Okay. Can everyone see the Yes. Yep. Yes, I can see. All right. So, basically for the purposes of this uh, conversation, we're really looking at justice from, you know, the simple question, what is the right thing to do? Even next. So as you know, we're talking about justice from the context of, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, and also from a uh, Nordic perspective. And I just want to assume that most of us understand, you know, what diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging is. You know, diversity, we really just think about it as demographic identifiers. So, you know, the things that you could potentially collect in a census, you know, your age, your gender, your race, your, your ethnicity, your religion, you know, your sexual orientation, things of that nature. Inclusion is how we are championed or encouraged to thrive. Equity is important because we need to recognize that equity is different from equality because equality is giving people the same thing, while equity is giving people the things that they need to arrive at a desired point. Um, also important to clarify here that oftentimes we understand justice as equity, whereas it is not quite equity. Uh, and of course, belonging is that warm, fuzzy feeling where you feel like you can show up as yourself. Um, so next on to... Eva mm -hmm. presents maybe, yeah. Mm -hmm. So next on to justice, um, again, what's the right thing to do? And then we'll move to the next. Mm -hmm. Also really important to define social justice because I think oftentimes um, when we talk about justice, we automatically think about social justice, you know, in terms of, I mean, for me, I, I often identified myself as a, social justice enthusiasts, because if there was ever a protest, I was there, right? And it's how do you show up to advocate against uh, the things that you think should, or the, th the wrongs that you think is happening? So if we look at it just from a basic, I think that's supposed to be United Nations, from a basic United Nations definition, you know, we broadly understand social justice as the fair and compassionate distribution of, you know, social economic fruits, so to say. So now I'm gonna go into justice and some definitions that I will read out. Um, justice is the ethical philosophical idea that people are to be treated impartially, fairly, properly, and reasonably by the law and by arbiters of the law. That laws are to ensure that no harm befalls another and that when harm is alleged, a remedial action is taken. Both the accuser and the accused receive a morally right consequence merited by their action. So next. Another definition about justice, because I think it's important to just show different aspects of it. Justice is a communal effort dedicated to creating and sustaining a fair and equal society in which each person and all groups are valued and affirmed. It encompasses efforts to end systemic violence and racism and all systems that devalue the dignity and humanity of any person. It recognizes that the legacy of past injustices remain all around us. So therefore promotes efforts to empower individual and communal action in support of restorative justice and the full implementation of human and civil rights. 
Uh, Eva, the next, please. So I said earlier that justice is often understood as synonymous with equity, but in fact, it requires nuance. And I think the nuance that it requires is that justice mandates reparations. Oftentimes when we think about equity, it's usually about you know, creating a system and including people in the process, giving them what they are due and ensuring that you meet them where they are, right? Justice is looking at, okay, what has happened and what needs to be done to acknowledge and atone for what has happened. Next, Eva. Maybe use your arrow, yeah? Next, previous. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I don't know what's going on. So just quickly on reparations. Reparations are basically, so th this is a really nice quote that I like on reparations. By our unpaid labor and suffering, we have earned the rights to the soil many times over and over. And now we are determined to have it. So you can think, when I th see this quote, I think about uh, 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 the uh, justice issue when it comes to land uh, between Nordic countries and say the Sami population, for example. Uh, next, please, Eva. So reparations are the action of making amends for a wrong one has done by providing payments or other atonements to those who have been wronged. Next, please. So it's really important that on reparations, because oftentimes, even when we have discussions about reparations from a justice perspective, the people deciding who those repara what those re reparations should be are often not the people who have been wronged or not the people who, uh, uh, who will supposedly benefit from said reparation. So it's important that interventions be led and designed by the people for whom it is meant for. Mm -hmm. uh, next, Eva. Did you go back? No, yes. I guess it's a okay. wandering page. <laughs> Type of justice. So there are different types of justice and we're not gonna go through all of them. Uh, there are four we've highlighted that I would just briefly nuance um, so we can continue on with the conversation. So the four focus for today is distributive, procedural, retributive, and restorative. So for distributive justice, we're thinking about it from the perspective of the action of determining who gets what and who gets to define to determine and define what people get. Procedural justice determines how fairly people are treated and also who gets to decide what is fair. Retributive justice is based on punishment for wrongdoing. And of course, restorative justice tries to restore relationship to rightness. And also we have to think about it from the perspective of who gets to decide what is right. And on restorative justice and thinking about who gets to decide what is right, we also have to think about how do we dismantle colonial perspective? How do we approach this from a decolonial perspective where uh, uh, rightness has been westernized, the way to show up in the world, the way to be professional, there's a right way to do things and there's a wrong way to do things. Who actually gets to make those decisions and how can we dismantle what currently is and create new structures? So basically, Jason, when you say here rightness, is that also something like fairness? I think not so much fairness, but what is the right thing to do? Because sometimes fair, depending on, uh, um, uh, depending on, of course, the power structure and the context, fair can be handed at as this is what I think is fair, but it may not necessarily atone or acknowledge harm that has been done. So in terms of rightness, ideally, at least from my perspective, if we're talking about situations, say like with indigenous folk, indigenous people should have to decide what is right and that rightness needs to be met, not necessarily when it intersects with Western ideals of what is right, so to say. Okay, I get it, thanks. <laughs> I guess we're moving on. Yes, please. Okay, and just really want to touch on when we talk about justice, we usually think about it from a, uh, uh, at least I usually think about it from when we're creating 
systems that dismantle oppression? Are we looking at it from a reform perspective or an abolitionist perspective? I can't deny the fact that I am skewed towards being an abolitionist, but I also recognize that in present day, in the systems and structures as we have them, abolition is not always possible. So what does reform look like? Next, Eva. So when we think about reform, we really think about it as putting interventions in place to make changes in current systems, current structures, current institutions, and current practice in order to improve it. So you take what is currently present. So you think about it as uh, uh, refurbishing an old furniture, so to say, to make it better, right? I know it's reducing it to furniture, but you get the point. It's just how do we reform it to make it better? And an abolitionist abolitionist perspective, Eva, for the next page, please, basically looks to stop, to dismantle, to abolish, and possibly to start afresh. When we talk about systemic oppression, discrimination, and racism, we have to think about it as a national, global, and interpersonal scene. And we have a moral obligation to want to see it end. Uh, a brilliant quote by Audre Lorde, who I love, uh, read the master's tool, we never dismantle the master's house. And my work in abolitionism usually looks at things from the perspective of what is currently there, how oppressive has it been set up, and how can we, is it possible to reform, or is it better to like, you know, like smash the whole thing down and start afresh? And then I think the next page just basically asks the question for today justice in the Nordics, is it possible? And I'm looking forward to engaging on this with my fellow panelists. So thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, Chisong. Stopping the share. Okay, uh, great, um, great introduction. Let me just uh, stop sharing the, um, for me, okay. So thank you for, for framing this and for giving us this um, uh, definitions. Uh, it was very interesting and, and, and really helpful, at least for me, because uh, sometimes I'm also not really sure uh, what we are talking about uh, um, and what we should talk about in the context of DIB when we talk about justice. Um, so I will, I will continue to Astrid. And um, <clears throat> with a question. So during our preparatory meeting, preparatory meeting, uh, you mentioned uh, DIB uh, and justice work. Uh, can you nuance how important is it to ensure that we do not cause harm or engage performatively with the required work? And why do you think the justice and discourse around it, comparatively, remain uncharted territory within DIB in Norway and let's let's assume also in the Nordics? Um, thank you, Eva, and um, <clears throat> thank you, Chizom, for such a concise overview of justice. Um, I um, I really like the way you contextualized it as being rooted in more than just this idea of of challenging. Uh, inequity and capturing this sense of reparation and repairing systemic oppression and, and harms of the past. And as a caveat to my answer today, I, I will say that this area of justice in, in the grand scheme of the DIBJ work that I've done, well, well firstly, it's, it's new to me. Um, I'm not an expert. I, um, I think I've probably been guilty of neglecting its inextricable link to the DI work I've done. And within that context, when did I become aware of it? I think I became aware of DIBJ work a few years ago when people started using the J on the end of the DIB. And more recently, there's been this more, um, what would you call it, quirky abbreviation, um, JEDI, which stands for um, Justice, Equity, diversity and inclusion. Um, and just to clarify for people who aren't uh, familiar with the concept, I'm sure everyone is, but Jedi in the um, Hollywood sense refers to a fictional sci-fi character from this 
um, multi-billion dollar movie franchise called Star Wars, which um, my eight-year-old son knows more about than I do. Um, and when I first saw Jedi being used as an abbreviation for justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, I, what did I think? I, I think I thought, oh, that looks cool. You know, I've, I've got a soft spot for an abbreviation. I, I lol and BTW in my text messages. And um, so my initial thoughts, I think, were, oh, here's a, here's a great way to... Um, here's a great way to attract some Star Wars lovers in the conversation. And, um, and I think that um, there's more to it than this, because um, perhaps we need to consider the problems with this reference. And I've since reflected on how the use of Jedi as terminology could be problematic and work against the very work that's trying to be achieved if we don't look beyond the surface of, you know, what's a seemingly eloquent sounding term. And I think if we want to use abbreviations, acronyms or, or whatever to make the work more engaging, um, it has to be contextualized in um, an authentic way. Um, otherwise there's limitations. So there's an article that really highlighted this to me from, um, the Scientific American 2021. I'll, I'll share a link to it in the comments afterwards. And, and this was interesting when it comes to Jedi and how we use justice and how we embed it intentionally or performatively, because it pointed out that while at first glance, it might be a fun, humorous reference, it's also a fictional set of sci-fi characters who in the movie are a religious order of intergalactic police monks with rather toxically masculine approaches to conflict resolution, like blowing things up with phallic lightsabers, violent jewels, wars. So it's pure sci-fi fantasy. And on the face of it, I mean, the question we might want to ask is, are these the best pillars of social justice advocacy? Um, and secondly, the, um, the Jedis of the Star Wars universe, they're a product. You know, they're a, they're a Hollywood product um, and incorporating a, a commercial product into our DEI work means that we're inadvertently promoting an organization or giving free, free advertising to, um, in this case, I think it's Disney now, but um, I might be wrong. And this raises a question around the disservice that could be done to meaningful justice work. So um, also bearing in mind, I suppose that Disney has a, a pretty murky history of propagating racist, sexist, and, and heterosexist narratives. And what's really at the forefront of this, um, because it might seem like I'm, I'm kind of blowing this out of proportion, is that it's distraction from real meanings. That's the problem, how it might distract from real meanings and, and true institutional justice work. You know, DIBJ, it isn't Star Wars co cosplay. You know, by conjuring up images of a Jedi universe, maybe we could be guilty of, um, of making light of a serious topic. And I think that for a lot of DEI practitioners, it's about being intentional in how we show up. And along with that is, is highlighting um, caution or concern about cultural associations that might be problematic or, or, that, um, or that might exclude others. And the fictional Jedis in the Star Wars uh, movie that come from a galaxy far, far away, this makes it a popular cultural reference that might also leave people out who don't get it. You know, there's a factor in who's represented in the movie and who isn't that could also harm the underpinning and understanding of um, people who are using Jedi. So, um, yeah, uh, if we give DEIBJ work the essence of a fantasy sci-fi movie, sci movie um, we're ignoring that these are real life problems um, and they affect real life people in a reprehensible way. So as a consequence of these considerations, I think it's wise to exercise justice, uh, sorry, exercise caution in, in how we use the word justice. Um, if we're failing to carry out work that, that, um, that builds into social justice, um, it's problematic ultimately. And, and if we use it without being very clear on where our work is linked to justice, we, we run the risk of turning it into a meaning, meaningless word and it can become like a, 
a passing fad that we've already seen. And, and worst of all is that it, it, it trashes the very people who've been harmed. So um, as to why Norway hasn't embraced the understandings, uh, the understandings around justice, well, DI work has become quite a commodified industry in Norway. It's still largely rooted in gender and the focus on racially marginalized and systemically excluded people is still uh, evolving. Um, I mean, it's very frustrating how few companies focus on anti-racist training, for example. Um, but that said, there are some really inspiring activists and some very strong activist movements happening in Norway. And, and to me, then these tend to be um, more closely linked to um, or more embedded in a social justice lens. So I think to leave this uh, to leave this answer on a um, on a solution oriented note that perhaps it's more community collaborations and um, co-working partnerships with justice led uh, activists and organizations might be a, a positive solution going forward. Thank you, Astrid. Ooh, a lot of food for thought. <laughs> so much came up to me listening to that. Just like if we even look at Jedi's, I wasn't like a huge Star Wars fa fan, so no offense to the, the, the fans here. But I think like it's the, the is someone unmuted or is it just me? I'm hearing something in background, but okay. I, I think that from my perspective, I often think about Jedi as almost white saviorism work, you know, where it's rooted in or buried in white supremacy in, in, in some sense. Um, and I think, you know, as Astrid said, it, it, of course, we need to approach that word with caution and with nuance, yeah. um, but we need to understand how misusing that word can also cause harm. And I think that's oftentimes what we forget in the practice is that when we talk about justice within a construct of uh, say social justice uh, or even within DEIB, uh, um, oftentimes it's just tossed out as, again, equity, but people who are defining and deciding what justice is for them, Oh, sorry, people who are defining what justice is are not actually the people for whom it's meant for. And that can be problematic and can continue to uphold, you know, oppressive systems and structures. So that just came up for me when you were speaking, Astrid. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chisholm. Um, does anyone have um, any other comments maybe? Anyone of the speakers or should I, shall I go? further to Alexandra. Okay, so Alexandra, uh, you're an inclusion and diversity lead in Avanant in Sweden. Uh, how do you think the Swedish population and workplace think about justice, if they do? And what are some of the challenges and opportunities in Sweden to engage with justice in the way that Chisholm uh, has nuanced it um, uh, previously? Yeah, uh, great questions, Eva. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, the first one about the Swedish population and workplace, how they think about justice, I think it's an interesting question, and I'll try to give you my viewpoint on it. I think, Chisholm, you had a great introduction to the topic, giving us an overall understanding of it. And to add to that, my view is that there's, there's a disconnect in information and lack of understanding when separating justice from equity, as we've just said. And I think that justice is a topic that is increasing in corporate conversations. And if we look at the Swedish population, I think the understanding will range largely depending on many things, um, some being age, race, social status, and, and more. If we then want to look at the corporate world, it can be tricky to get a read. And we've mentioned this, Eva, you mentioned this in the introduction, justice is talked about, but to what full extent corporations really are understanding what it means is hard to say. Many companies are still focusing on the topic of equity and how to create equitable workplaces. And I think that workplaces in general in Sweden um, or the Swedish workplace is a very unfledged practitioner when it comes to justice. We have a lot to learn still. So to talk about then challenges going forward, if we look at Nordic culture and history and the way that we speak about things, 
we tend to talk around the topic. Um, in my opinion, the Nordic culture is not a very confrontational culture. So in our nature, there are some conversations that are often shied away from. And I guess we can call this lack of accountability, but then the opportunity becomes trying to fill that gap. So workplaces have a responsibility to educate themselves, to acknowledge the past and understand what does this mean for me as a Swedish company, as an actor in the business field today, and as a corporation willing to take responsibility for doing the right thing. And not only that, but creating forums for these discussions to take place, or at the very least, participate in them. That's the first step, right? Just starting to talk about it. Um, and I think here is where the catch-22 might have been, because companies will not want to take responsibility for something they don't fully understand. It's a lot easier to shy away. But looking at the corporate, call it market, there's been a shift in the way that we work and integrate IND and DEI topics. And it's becoming very intertwined with organizational health um, in the business world and businesses are needing to adapt. You can't really shy away from this anymore. And I think realizing the journey and having the courage to take those first steps towards it, acknowledge what you know, acknowledge what you don't know on the topic, um, that will be crucial in embarking on the path towards justice. And I say towards because I think for many, this will be uh, an awakening still, unfortunately. And also to be frank, it will be very uncomfortable. And we need to understand in this fact that we don't have all the answers. That's why we need to have these discussions to reflect, to understand. Um, it's a lot to unpack and to learn and reflect upon. And I think that's the first step that we need to take before we can do anything else. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, really important, uh, important things. Um, did you, did, does anyone uh, of the speakers have anything to add? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, thank you so much. This is uh, already very, very interesting. Um, I think that even though the Nordic countries do resemble each other, I think it's also very important that we differentiate because uh, I think uh, Sweden is probably the, the country that I know best without being Swedish and, and knowing the culture from, from inside, uh, where I know also that there are quite uh, vast differences in the way that Swedes and Danes uh, go towards, um, yeah, to talk about racism and discrimination, where in Denmark, uh, we are very direct and we are very, um, like we say it as it is, where we think of Swedes as uh, wrapping it up and not wanting to actually talk about the problem. Um, and therefore, um, I think that in Denmark, uh, it's more to do about the fact that we just don't want to see ourselves as racist and we don't acknowledge it. We see ourselves as good people and good people cannot be uh, uh, racist people and therefore I mean we do not acknowledge that we are actually still a colonial power we do not um, uh, teach in history I mean I didn't know that we actually enslaved people and traded with uh, enslaved people before I was in my late 30s, maybe even early 40s, because we never uh, learned anything about it in school. So I think that in that way, um, Denmark and Sweden, at least, there might be uh, uh, some differences still. Also, when I hear about uh, where we are uh, in the process, um, because I had the fortunate, uh, or I was fortunate to work with uh, the Swedish um, Fire and Rescue Service uh, down in Melmö, uh, that was back in 2018. And they had already, for example, um, done DNI work for the past 10 years, where Denmark was still just on the verge. Now in the Fire and Rescue Service, they are working with it. So I think that even though there are a lot of similarities, there are also a lot of differences which major, uh, make a huge impact. Hmm. I would have a following question, <laughs> a follow-up question for that what you said, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so go ahead. Just wanted to add like, <clears throat> I think as much as the Nordic countries are different and they're very different, 
uh, uh, and when I say the Nordic countries as well, I think it's really important that we remember that it's not just the big countries. It's not Iceland, not just Iceland, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, which am I forgetting, Finland, but it's also Greenland and Orland and Faroe Island and Sami, right? We often ignore, you know, those people. And that's absolutely ridiculous because we have to think as them as those people, not as part of the Nordics, but they're absolutely a part of the Nordics. And I think one thing that is at least from the experience I have, like doing work in the Nordics and doing research in the Nordics, is a genuine sense of denial. We deny, 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 deny. What do you mean? This wonderful country that flows with milk and honey, this beautiful region where we've achieved and surpassed gender equality. You know, let's not talk about, I mean, you're just staring up things. And so there's a lot of gaslighting that happens when you bring up something that goes even a tiny bit outside of the almighty or beautiful perfect region. And the best way to solve any problem is to admit that it exists. And for a lot of different people, for indigenous folk, for people of a global majority, for different type of women, for people who don't fit within the gender binary, challenges remain. And denying their existence and their lived experiences does not serve us. And this is inherently what the problem is in a lot of Nordic countries is we don't want to address that. Let's not shake that tree, you know? And of course we can dig into why we, we can barely collect data uh, in the Nordics, right? We collect data on gender, we collect data on nationality and we collect data on age. And in many ways we can argue as they argue that this data that we don't collect is put there to protect our identities. But it's also worth questioning, why don't we collect data? Because we don't want to see what we know is happening. And ultimately, when policies and practices are put into place, we need data to prove them. Politicians want data. Businesses want data. Leaders want data. But if you're not allowed to collect that data to see the differences in experiences in healthcare, in education, in livelihood, we're not going to solve a problem. And this is uniquely Nordic in approach. So I think that's also something we need to shake on because we need to figure out how can we address the problems that exist without collecting data. And it is possible to absolutely do so. And then when we bring up this discussion as there are other ways to measure this without you know, infringing on people's rights or identities and you're still protecting them, people fall back to the, yeah, but we need data, right? So I think it's something we should all feel responsible for in, yeah. That's just my little rant. I'm going to shut up now. Eva, please continue. <laughs> no, 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 Chisholm, please don't shut up. I think this is this is really super important. Um, super important to talk about and, and yeah, comment on. Yes, Manisa, please. <laughs> Thank you. Because when we look at data, at least in, in Denmark, it's very um, important to distinguish between uh, the data that we can subtract when we talk about business. Right now, there's actually um, a lot of work being done for us to be able to uh, anonymously uh, and with consent collect data on people's um, sexuality, ethnicity, and so on. So I really hope that this is, uh, is going to uh, yeah, be changed so we so so we can actually uh, collect this data because I I completely agree with you, Chisholm. Then at least in Denmark, um, so yes, we're allowed to uh, collect data on nationality. But what we have also done in Denmark is that we have um, st statistical um, names not names categories for people who are for example of so-called western descent and non-western descent and now we have either even further um uh what's it called um uh made a new box for people from these so-called uh minap t countries which is middle east northern africa pakistan and turkey so um, when and why I'm I'm uh, talking about this is because we actually have a lot of data where we can see that uh, people, for example, uh, of non-Western descent, 
they are there are so many more kids uh, living in in relative poverty for example um but we don't do anything about it we have a lot of uh data that actually uh, shows the social injustice but nothing is being done about it we also have data that shows that people of uh, so-called non-Western uh, descent are doing really well. We don't acknowledge that, we don't celebrate it. So the whole thing about um, how we actually uh, talk about people and what data we collect, we can actually collect some and, and a lot in Denmark, but we just don't use it for good, at least in my perspective. So I think that's quite similar to Norway, and I guess maybe I should have nuanced that, is you you have like statistical bureaus, in Norway we have SSB, that does collect, I'm sure they know a lot about a lot, but there's no point having data that cannot be actioned. So ultimately, the data that can be actioned are still these three data, which does not necessarily show more, beyond, more, uh, does not allow us to create interventions that could be potentially impactful. And it is also important, and I think it's absolutely, like in, in Norway as well, we do collect, uh, uh, I think they collect data on uh, what you might call it, people who are not, for, for example, from Western backgrounds. But I think there's also, it can also be problematic in that you are basically, or we are basically quantifying an entire group of people, people of the global majority are significantly more than people with Western backgrounds, right? Well, quantifying them as, as one and then understanding and not able to disaggregate data and drill into what are some challenges that even within groups that are not, say, let's say, minoritized or historically underrepresented groups, even within those groups, we're not able to understand the differences and the similarities in how we do this work and in how we create interventions with the the the, the leadership and uh, 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 the design of the people for whom those you know interventions are created. So I do agree there is data, but there's not data we can actually action. And inherently for me, that's more or less not having data that we can work with. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I guess, uh, does anyone have any more comments? Any of the speakers? I also invite um, our audience, I see that there were some comments and some questions. Thank you very much for that. But we we encourage you to please comment and ask questions. Don't be shy. This is this is a place to also learn. So no question is a wrong or bad question. Okay, so let's um, let's continue with Munisa. Um, so we have mentioned many times uh, at many of our events and. Chisholm mentioned it also now, um, that in the Nordic there's a resistance and denial when it comes to openly talking about inequitable systems and structures. And of course, Denmark is no exception. Um, in your opinion, Minza, what is the general atmosphere in Denmark when it comes to their history connected to colonization? Uh, is it wildly, uh, wildly, is it widely acknowledged? And do you think that Denmark is ready to talk about its past and present day engagement with colonization and inequities? If yes, to whom is justice owed? If not, what do you think is needed to move the needle from the conversation for the conversation to even begin? I know there's a lot of questions, so please, uh, uh, if you want me, I can I can say it again or or go one by one. Let me know. Um... Please remind me because I'm bound to forget some of the questions, but the, the short answer, uh, the sad answer is that in my opinion, no, we are not. Um, I think that there are a lot of people that we owe uh, apologies to, but also to make uh, justice happen for. So um, as I just mentioned, obviously, uh, Denmark was also uh, a nation that enslaved uh, people, um, and uh, and yeah, that was uh, when we uh, were the owners of of the Virgin Islands. Um, obviously, we are still a colonial uh, power um, in the sense that uh, we have 
and I don't know the English word for it, I'm sorry, but what we call in Danish Rigsfællesskab, so a unity with Greenland and the Faroe Islands. Um, also, if we think about the uh, migrants uh, who came to Denmark uh, back in the 60s and 70s, I do believe that we can also uh, say that we owe them an apology in the sense that we invited uh, these, now I'm using the term directly translated from Danish, um, these foreign workers up to be guests, uh, guest workers in Denmark. Now, when we all know that when you're a guest, you come and then you leave again. Um, but people also settled here and now we are doing nothing uh, to actually appreciate all the hard work and labor that they made possible so that Denmark could, uh, could evolve as a country. And now we only, for the most part, see uh, bashing of people uh, with especially uh, Muslim backgrounds or from the so-called MENA uh, T countries. So, yeah, um, the short answer is no, and that we uh, owe reparations and justice to a, a lot of people. And unfortunately, I don't think that this is something that will um, be done right now. But I think that the one positive thing is that we have uh, at least started talking about it. Should mm. we do this? Unfortunately, in from what I gather from the news, uh, we are still not there. Uh, the Netherlands uh, actually just formally apologized uh, for their um, uh, power as, uh, or for their history as uh, enslaving people. We also had the discussion in, in Denmark, but the government said no. Um, there have been a lot of horrible, horrible, um, sort of uh, experiments uh, done uh, with especially the uh, people of Greenland. And now we have started um, recognizing uh, some of the injustice that we have done and the talk about apologizing for these injustices have started. Um, but still we are far, far behind and we actually just had one of the representatives uh, of uh, the Greenland um, government uh, speaking uh, in Greenlandic in, in our, um, what's it called, uh, parliament, which I thought was quite fantastic because obviously uh, when we have this unity, we should be able to speak all the uh, languages in our unity. But um, here there was also a big, uh, big uh, discussion and also dismissal of, of, of this uh, person who had dared to, to speak Greenlandic because we are only supposed to speak Danish. Mm. So that was a small anecdote, yeah. Mm, wow. Well, um, I'm, I'm uh, really missing Nivika here because uh, she's from Greenland and she's told us a lot of stories and I'm, I'm sure she would she would have a lot to say a lot to say, you know, how it is on Greenland and how the the, the relationship is. Um, but it's it's really interesting that Denmark um, is kind of from from what you said. They're talking about it, but they're not doing anything. Um, but what do you think? What do you think has to happen? Actually, you know, for for something to change especially I mean, from, from present perspective, if, if there's possible that, that it goes a little bit further than the conversation. I, I do acknowledge that uh, we have started at least talking about it. I think that it's important to notice that, uh, for example, uh, the municipality of Copenhagen, and even also on a national level, we are talking about um, anti-racism and we're actually using the word racism, which is um, quite groundbreaking in Denmark uh, because we do not see ourselves, I mean, I think that the majority of people uh, see themselves as colorblind, um, which we know is not true and which is uh, actually uh, hugely oppressing. But um, I think that we need to acknowledge first and foremost, uh, we, we're still uh, lacking that acknowledgement and we're lacking the uh, 
why it's actually important to, to uh, give apologies, to uh, do these reparations, uh, because a lot of people will say, but hey, uh, I don't believe in enslaving people, but this was 175 years ago, so what has this to do with me? And we do not accept that there are uh, so many historical injustices that still um, have been reproduced and are still produced uh, to this day today. Um, so acknowledgement to begin with, um, that's for sure. Yeah, I'm that's-, that's that. mm -hmm. Yes, Eva, I think, uh, I do agree with Moniza. I think there's a lot that needs to be done around awareness. I mean, there's so much we didn't know about Denmark and its connections and history to Greenland, for example, before we started engaging with people from Greenland who do this work. And I think raising awareness almost drives outrage because you hear of the things that have happened to Greenlandic folks and just some of them which, you know, uh, um, I can share, for example, is that there was a campaign, I think in the 60s, uh, where the Danish government colluded with some Greenlandic doctors uh, as a way to, uh, 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 I'm paraphrasing, but as a way to control population, they, without the permission of Greenlandic women, inserted spirals for birth control without the permission or knowledge of these women. So a lot of them ended up not be, being infertile, having a lot of problems for a lot of their lives without even knowing what was going on with them. Another aspect is that, you know, Danish men would go to Greenland, impregnate women and leave. And they did not have to take responsibility as uh, um, uh, as all parental spousal, parental support in any way. They didn't have to take any responsibility. They could just say, no, that's not my child. And, you know, their word is, is set in stone. So I think also, in my opinion, and, and maybe I'm a bit out there, I think Denmark is probably one of the last remaining colonial power. I mean, we still have issues with France and countries in Africa, of course, but colonization is still continuing in some way because from what I understand talking to Greenlanders, it's so difficult to think about Greenlandic issues, challenges, opportunities outside of Denmark. And it's mm -hmm. ridiculous that this is continuing to happen. And we don't know about it because it's not, you know, like it, it's it's not popularized. The people who get to speak through to power are not doing it because it's not in their vested interest to do so. So at a time when other colonizers in the world were denouncing and apologizing for their role, Greenland just kind of skated right through. Right. And in some sense, it's still continuing to this day. Very true. Yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah absolutely. I mean, what Netherlands apologized, Belgium apologized, but they basically don't have um, their their uh, the, the, the 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 people, the colonies under them uh, still as the Denmark does. Um, yeah, sorry, can I say something quickly? Because I see here someone is saying that reparations are a very controversial topic across the world. And in their view, is not a DEIB objective. We need to focus on equality and fairness in institutions and private workplaces. I think that sounds really beautiful in theory, but in practice, it doesn't necessarily go that way. We cannot focus on equality. We need to start thinking about equity because without equity, we cannot really attain equality. So yes, this, you know, like the blanket statement and perspectives, they matter, but we need to think about how does this actually play out on a tangible granular level? What do we need to do to actually inform the change that is necessary? Also important to note that reparations is not all about giving somebody money or somebody you know paying for a crime sometimes reparation is acknowledging Eva I wronged you and I am sorry it's sometimes as simple as that acknowledging where wrong has been done so I think this is also why it's important to nuance what reparation is that it's not this thing that they have to give or something has to be taken away from them sometimes it's just saying I'm sorry for the harm that is caused, right? If, for example, and this is, you know, if some if something harm, harmful happens to somebody, say a form of harassment, you know, telling them to move on, let's focus on, you know, the greater good and equality doesn't serve, you know, the harm that they've been they've endured. But saying I acknowledge that I was wrong and I hurt you 
What do you need to be better? How can I make this situation better? And sometimes it's just, I really just needed an apology. And I think we've all been in situations in our lives where we're just like, I just wanted my mom or my dad or my sister to apologize to me for what they did. It's a reparation. It's a form of it. So just wanted to nuance that. Thank you, Chisong. Uh, I guess we are, um, we have about five minutes uh, before we're supposed to go to our uh, audience questions. Uh, so last question for you, Chisong, is considering Nordic's resistance to talk about anything that could uh, shatter their image of a perfect best place to live, an inclination to erase their history, uh, that doesn't go with that image. Um, what do you think are the opportunities of actually introducing justice in that narrative and what is needed for that to happen? Oh, I don't, honestly, I, I go through days where I'm just like, justice is possible. And some days I'm just like, nah, we're oh, not there. <laughs> you know, and I think there's also truth in acknowledging where we are and working, you know, it's important, like in doing DI work, we often say it's important to meet people where they are. Right now, we're not at a point of justice. Right now, we need to focus on things like inclusion and equity, right? But even in how we focus on inclusion and equity, we can't hug fragility and center comfort, right? We need to be able to have honest, brave and courageous conversation, not pointing fingers, not calling people out, right? Because oftentimes a lot of this discourse is like, you're at fault. It's your grand great grandfather that did this and you're a middle-aged white man. So you're the reason for everything that's wrong in the world. You know, that doesn't get us anywhere. But how can we engage in this courageous conversations without centering our fragility, our comfort and ourselves? Because oftentimes as well, it's the, it's the feeling of blame and the fear to engage. And I think it's quite important to reframe, you know, what is uncomfortable and what is difficult. I often say I reframe uncomfortable conversation to necessary conversations. And that automatically does a switch in my head because, no, I don't want to sit in a room and have an uncomfortable conversation, but am I willing to do a necessary conversation? Absolutely. Right. So I think, you know, it's in first being willing to show up and have these conversations and both sides, all sides cannot do this conversation with blame or finger pointing because we're not gonna get anywhere. The reality is that many of us benefit, all of us in some sense, some of us more than others from systems of oppression, right? And while we have not contributed to those systems, we do benefit from it, but we cannot blame the person that benefits from it without their say so. The world was just created like that and they didn't ask to come to the world, right? They are here. And how can we have the conversation to bridge understanding where we can meet each other and understand and collectively move forward together because we know that together, we can do a whole lot more than when we do it individually in silos or in groups. We need all groups. We need the middle-aged white men. We need, you know, the non-binary folk. We need the trans folk. We need the straight folk. We need the black folk, the indigenous folk, right? We need the Latinx people. So it's quite important that we center everyone, listen to all different perspectives and not get fragile and then think about what is the right thing to do and how can we do it together? Ooh, wow, <laughs> a lot of things to do. Um, does anyone from the speakers have anything to add um, to, Chisholm's, to Chisholm's answer? What do you think? Maybe you have a perspective on how, how we can start with it. Well, I, 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 a... <laughs> I, completely, uh, I completely agree. And, I, and therefore, I also think that it's so important that we talk about privilege, because I think that we are still so oblivious to what privilege actually is. It's not that you were born in a rich family where um, your parents could give you everything you pointed at. It's also the fact that for me, for example, I'm a cisgendered heterosexual woman that gives me certain privileges. Um, even though, yeah, I can have other barriers because of my brown skin color. Um, so in addition to that, I think that um, if we, yeah, because I wholeheartedly agree that the problem with these uh, agendas is that people uh, feel that um, 
there are pointing fingers uh, at them. But if we could sort of see that we are all privileged and we all have barriers, uh, also uh, white heterosexual men, for example, they can also have experienced barriers, but they're just historical barriers that, um, for example, due to race and ethnicity that, um, yeah, doesn't grant you, for example, equal access to the workplace or to other institutions of uh, society. Mm. Thank you, Misa. That's and I just... wonder if like learning, like listening, because sometimes if you're in your own cocoon with people who are like you entire life, you know, you might not recognize the challenges that other people face. And privilege is really important, like understanding how fluid privilege can be, you know, how you can have it in some instances and then not have it in others. You know, when this conversation come up, it's really important to listen to understand rather than listen to respond, right? Because it's not about you, right? We're talking about systems and structures, but ultimately systems and structures are made up by, pe by people like you and people like me, right? So if we don't listen, we will be unable to dismantle those systems. Because I think sometimes when we talk about systems, we think it's this like big mighty house or like big bad guy in the sky there's nothing we can do about it there is absolutely something we can do about it because we make up the systems and many in many ways as well sometimes people who are also marginalized and people who come from underrepresented historically underrepresented groups you know also uphold oppressive systems just because it's been passively accepted and they've been socially programmed to do so so it's how do we listen and engage and how do we leverage our privilege and our power and our allyship because allyship is an active state of being right you, you it's easy to be an ally when you have nothing to lose but allyship matters when you know something is at stake it's easy to like be at home and on the computer and be a couch ally but that's not the goal how can we actually dismantle systems oh yes <laughs> absolutely good question um uh, does anyone uh, has anything to add before we move to the audience questions? Okay, so we had a quite engaging uh, audience today. Thank you. Thanks all of you for the comments. Please keep them coming. It was really um, interesting. So what I will start with is Fadima asked, uh, it would be great uh, with some examples of justice work put into practice. So can anyone just give some examples or how it works? I have boatloads of examples from like, <laughs> <laughs> from like the US, Australia, the UK, and even like the African context. But I, 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 I'm trying to like frame this for like the Norwegian or the Nordic context. I think justice could be potentially, you know, um, there is, uh, I'm just making something up here, but we found, uh, uh, I'm not making, it's, it's happened, but we found a lot of oil in, you know, Samiland, and it has potential to make us billions and billions of dollars or knock. Uh, um, and this would be very beneficial for the Norwegian economy, society, la de la de la. Um, However, we are taking away, you know, land that is inherently a part of uh, 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 the way of life, say for Sami people. Um, and we're taking away the rights of people to make decisions. Generally, when things like this happen, it's usually the big bad corporations or, you know, they come with all their money and their bank and their suits uh, and they offer something in return. You know, justice is listening to the people in, who say no, this is part of our ancestral land. You can't touch this. And justice would be quite enough going somewhere else, finding something else to do and leaving for the people what is rightfully theirs. That is how I think a justice process should go. You know, uh, uh, where people have a right to their land and to say what happens to their land. Uh, just thinking about this within, you know, like a, a very uh, um, naughty context. I think if, if we look at it from, uh, a, say, for example, what we talked about from a Greenlandic perspective is people in Greenland, uh, a lot of whom want their 
proper independence get to decide what that looks like for them in relation to Denmark, as opposed to Denmark telling Greenlanders what that would look like for them. So those are two examples that I can currently think of from a Nordic perspective, but of course there are different ways in which this unfolds uh, in, 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 in the African context, in, 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 in the US uh, context, and also in contexts across the world. I think it's also good if you like mention some of the good practices uh, abroad, because that is also a good example, even if, or do you think that it cannot apply to the Nordics? Sorry, say that again, Eva. I said that uh, even experiences from abroad um, are really good to kind of know how they handle something, even if it's even if it's like US, they have a, a different situation, but but um, it's good to know or... Um... Absolutely. There's a whole discourse though about how, because oftentimes when we talk about within DEIB and you bring in the US context or the British context, people are quick to tell you, oh, this is not the US and this is not the UK. You're trying to import US mm -hmm. challenges and UK challenges. So this is why I'm also quite careful and intentional when talking about the Nordic, Nordics to keep it within you know, the Nordics. Of course, yeah, I think there's so much more we can learn from global contexts where conversations, you know, you know, I had, I think, as we talked about earlier, where, uh, um, you know, what barely scratching the surface, you know, well, in other countries, in other contexts, they are scratching the surface and digging a freaking hole, right? Mm -hmm. And we're not there yet. So, but it's also important to meet the Nordics where it is in terms of understanding and how can we use that understanding and move forward. Astrid wanted to say something. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, yeah, I, I was just going to say in, in answer to this question as well, I, I sort of, you know, I'm, I'm reflecting as, as you talk and as we talk and, and I think that having having done a role where I was responsible for um, cultivating a diversity and inclusion strategy for a, a company with a thousand people, um, I'm, you know, I left justice out of the conversation. So I think in answer to the question, how can we bring it into Nordic workplaces? I think we probably have to start at the grassroots of defining it because you know we're having a more progressive conversation about it today but I, I you know I think of the last you know four companies I've worked in in Norway it isn't being talked about and and so what can we do there we we need to get it on the agenda you know it's all fine use Jedi if you are having the conversation and the dialogue and being intentional around justice but I think that that's probably um where there's some room for uh, impact and some room for, 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 for outcomes, tangible outcomes, if we put it on the subject and actually start to have the conversation. So uh, companies who really want to do DEIBJ work, the J is important as the D, the E, the I and the B. And I think that's something very, very obvious that's being missed at the moment. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Astrid. Um, I'm going to move on, just uh, being mindful of the time. We have uh, 12 more minutes and for now, three more questions. So um, there's a question for Chisholm from Yemen. I hope I uh, pronounced the, the, the name correctly, uh, which says, uh, Norway's focus on gender equality in its EDI movement instead of racial justice is a direct reflection of the prominence of white supremacy in Norway that is well ignored. The research shows that anti-black uh, anti racist trainings are riddled with white supremacist lingo and truly does not address the underlying concern of white Norwegians fear of letting go of control and power. How can we best start the conversation around how racial justice does not equate to racialized communities oppressing white communities? Uh, what a question, Iman. Uh, uh, the name is Iman, by the way, Eva. Oh. Um, uh, it's a big one. I think even while Eva was reading out the question, I was just like, oh, this is not a conversation I want to have in public because <laughs> I'm not about to be cancelled. <laughs> you know, and I think that's the reality is, is it's really difficult. And, and I'm trying to like work through answering this as honestly and as palatable as possible. Um, but I think it's about erasure. I, I think when you talk about anti-Black racism, it's erasure. I think 
in many sense, we don't exist in the Nordics, you know, we exist, but we don't exist. And I think if, I don't want to nuance that because I just don't want to unpack <laughs> just the trauma of what it is to exist as a black person in, in, in this context. Um, but I do think that there is that general global fear in the West or maybe Western fear of addressing racism, especially, you know, when it has to do with anti-blackness. You know, we want to talk about racism when it concerns, you know, everyone, but there is a special dose of racism that Black people experience or Black presenting people experience that we don't want to engage with because it's too difficult. And oftentimes when it's that engagement has happened, we've unfortunately fallen into the finger pointing uh, blame giving, and sometimes also just navigating, you know, white fragility, white comfort, um, and what type of words can we use? And, you know, I can tell you, even I run a lot of anti-racism sessions, and I present different, uh, 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 I, I, I address them differently, depending on the crowd, you know, and it's also important to meet the crowd where they are, to meet your audience where they are in, you know, uh, uh, how do we lightly, very actually get people to understand what challenges are faced, not just on an interpersonal level, but in all systems across society, including the healthcare, right? So Black people have a different experience with the healthcare system in the Nordics. And I am living proof of this, where I have experiences on experiences. And I can also share that at least two, three times a week, I receive a message on LinkedIn from a Black woman in Norway or in the Nordics. And it's the same story, different flavor, but exactly the same thing. And it's just exhausting to exist in this space. But it's also back to the conversation about justice. Can we start with talking about justice? No. <laughs> I think we need to start with talking about inclusion. We need to start with talking about awareness. We need to start with talking about acceptance and think some sense of equity and equality in the way we address things. We're not there yet. And I want to say, just shake that tree. But we might, I think it's important to share honestly, but also to be practical in how we address, you know, the challenges that arise. And that doesn't answer your question, which I, I get it, um, but... I think it's difficult to apply beyond just saying, I mean you no harm. I'm not here to take away anything from you. I'm just here to nuance a challenge that is present and thriving for a lot of, say, people of color and especially Black folk in the Nordic. I hope that kind of answers the question without answering the question, sorry. <laughs> Eva, you're on mute. I said, thank you, Susan. Uh, and I said, uh, I'm going to move on because we have only seven minutes and I would really like to kind of cover all of the questions. Um, so we have a question from Deborah, by the way, she's in Tokyo. So hi, Deborah in Tokyo. Uh, how open is the discussion in schools in the Nordics countries? Um, I'm guessing Deborah meant justice. I don't know if any of you, I know that the, I don't know if any of you actually have any experiences with, um, oh, okay, Asri, thank you. Well, I, I can I can speak to um, what, um, I have three school age kids, so I can speak to what they've covered because, you know, when my kids come home and say, oh, we're doing, um, we're doing Black Lives Matter or doing this, I'm obviously very, very on board. I'm like, right, what are you doing for the weekend? You and I are going to have some fun. But um, um, LGBTQ plus is very well covered. It's on the uh, agenda of Norwegian schools, as is learning about Sami culture. But let's just say we learn about Sami culture and perhaps not the um, murky, uncomfortable history. It's more of an embracing. And in terms of anti-racist sort of education for children, the only thing I've been aware of is that on the school curriculum is the film The Hate You Give. 
I don't know if anyone's seen it. It's a very, very well-known film. And actually, it's a great film to show to teenagers as well. It's like a really, really emotional, moving, probably quite teachable moment film. But beyond that, there's not very much. So I think there really is work to be done here for educators to, to, to help them get these subjects on the agenda across the sort of whole holistic agenda of, uh, of diversity and inclusion. So some things I've seen, but um, uh, yeah, so much potential to, to, to do more for mm. the kids and the up and coming generation. Um, I'm very interested to know what anyone else has got to add to that from Denmark, Sweden as well, if it's different. I see um, uh, Alex uh, raise her hand. Yes, yeah, and not much to add. I mean, I, I kind of want to give my own experience. I think I'm glad to hear, in a sense, Astrid, that there's a bit more now. Although, I mean, uh, we still have ways to go. Um, growing up, so I have an American background, American father, black father, white mother. Uh, moved to Sweden when I was six, and I was very aware already at the time about the the differences, and you know, having. Um, in my case, brown skin, but having black skin and living in a white man's society, so to say. Um, moving then to Sweden, an hour outside of Stockholm, I lived in a very small town where there was little to none mention about um, injustice and justice. I mean, there were brief conversations and coverage of like the Sami culture and so on. But again, no negative lens, all positive and so on. American history, yes, but very broad and very um, unfortunately considered, it was considered that I was in the room. Well, we have an American here. So let's just kind of, you know, put a blanket over it. And then that's that. And we've covered the topic. So there is a lot more to be covered. And I mean, this is, to be honest, 20 years ago. So it's obviously evolved. But thinking about my own personal experience, there is so much more that we need to do in education as well. Hmm. Just quickly on education as well. I think there's a lot. Uh, there's, there's the, I have a daughter who's at kindergarten and, you know, like I don't have experience from say like school. Uh, but I think what I've noticed is a lack of representation, even in the books that I read, the toys that I played with. So I'm always that mother who brings a bunch of toys and a bunch of books like I donated. You're welcome. Right. Because I think it's important for kids to have this nuance. I want my daughter to see ballerinas in wheelchairs. You know, I want them to interact th with things like this. Um, but from also an academic perspective, I think university needs to be severely decolonized. You know, I can remember going to university and studying African history that was written by a non-African, you know, and of course, like in hindsight, where I know a lot more about African history, I'm just like, whoa, the brainwash, the brainwash, right? Because things are presented from somebody's perspective and usually from a Western lens where we're good or saviors. This is how we view things. And this is how we brought civilization to this group. So I think there's a lot in academia. And I know there's a lot that's happening like in the people, you know, like Rahwa, uh, for example, who does a lot of work about around decolonizing academia here in Norway. So, I mean, there are ways to go. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Chisum, if you remember, uh, last year we had a intern and she was, I think from Nigeria. And she was saying how she's studying, uh, they were studying something from, from African uh, uh, history. Nobody asked her and she had to do a paper on the books and theories that were done by white people. And, and she didn't agree, it was ridiculous to her. And she was African. She could have had some insights, but she had to use all those books and theories that to her made no sense. Thing yeah. about knowledge creation, right? Who gets yeah. to control the creation yeah. of knowledge and how mm -hmm. does it spread? I know she was sharing that she has to do a paper on that and it's ridiculous to her. Um, yeah, I don't know. Look, people, we have just maybe less than a minute. So I'm not going to start um, any questions. I'm really sorry that we didn't get to all of the questions. I think this is a conversation that actually needs to continue. 
and I know uh, knowing Chisholm, this this uh, conversation will definitely continue. Um, so uh, we will definitely have those questions in mind uh, uh, next time. Um, I hope you learned a lot. Uh, all of you, I know I have. Um, thank you all for uh, for joining us from everywhere in the world, uh, the audience, and a special thanks to the speakers um, because uh, 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 this is this is probably the first thing that you kind of came to uh, after vacation. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for, for your contributions. And as I said, the, the, the conversation will continue and I'm sure that, and I'm looking forward to see Astrid <laughs> in more of our events and all of you also. Uh, Chisan, do you maybe also have some, some last words? Oh, just thank you all. Um, uh, thanks for being here to the panelists. Astrid, you're an OG. Uh, thanks for coming back, uh, Muniza. Uh, I know we'll be seeing you more on here. Same with Alexandra as well. Really appreciate your time and everyone who's participated, you know, online, the questions. Uh, there were a lot of really great questions that we didn't get to. So thank you for engaging. It means a lot to us. Um, yeah. Eva, yes. thank you for holding us down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that was not a problem. I I was enjoying myself. And and yes. The, the conversation definitely continues at the, our Diversify Nordic Summit because we will talk about everything through the justice lens. Uh, that is the topic. Uh, so I'm also looking forward to that. It's going to be a whole day of a lot of new things to learn and to contribute. Uh, so I hope to see you all at the end of September in Oslo.